Good afternoon, attendees. Uh, we're gonna give it just about 30 seconds or so, let people trickle in, watching the attendance numbers rise, uh, and we'll get started. All right, well, I have it on my clock that we're about a minute after noon, so I'm gonna get started with my introduction. Um, welcome to Energy Law and Policy 101, which is part of the Intro to Environmental Law series produced by the Environmental Law section and co-sponsored with the New Lawyers section of the California Lawyers Association. We're especially grateful today to have you join us for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, this is the kickoff to the fourth year of our 101 series, and we'll have lots of other great programs planned for you throughout the summer. And also, uh, this is a special edition of our 101 series because it's planned in conjunction with the, the Environmental Law Section's Energy Law Conference, which is held every other year and is being held this year in Oakland uh, on Friday, April 19th. Uh, if you're interested in the topic of energy law and you're here today, I highly recommend that you register for that event. If you haven't yet, it is free for law students and pre-registration will be open until the end of the day, Friday, April 12th, and spots are filling very quickly. So please register if you're interested. Next slide, please. Sorry, Nick. No problem. There we go. Thank you. So if you're new to the California Lawyers Association, this slide just provides some context uh, for who and what CLA consists of. So CLA is the parent body for 18 separate sections, which each focus on a different field of law. It's a voluntary nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the professional advancement of attorneys practicing in California. And it was created in 2018 to house the sections after they were separated from the State Bar of California. The new lawyers section is one of the sections within CLA. NLS represents all California lawyers within the first eight years of practice. And its mission is to advance practical skills, leadership and pro bono opportunities, networking and support to meet the unique needs of California's diverse community of new lawyers. N NLS was formerly known as the California Young Lawyers Association or CYLA, and they've served new lawyers in California since their creation by the State Bar's Board of Trustees in 1965. The Environmental Law Section, ELS, is another section within CLA, and its mission is to advance the quality, breadth, and availability of information and services related to environmental, natural resources, land use, and of note today, energy law, and to enhance the profession by cultivating a well-informed, collegial, and diverse group of lawyers and law students throughout the state. Next slide, please. So this list is just some ways that you can get involved uh, with CLA, the Environmental Law Section, and the New Lawyers Section. We have webinars and in-person events, including the aforementioned Energy Law Conference, Yosemite Conference, First Seed Inclusion Conference, and then this 101 series, as well as CLA's annual meeting and other networking events. We have online MCLE materials. Uh, you can also uh, participate more actively by submitting an article for e-news or section publications. Uh, I know for a fact that the new lawyers section just put out a call for new articles in its monthly digest within the past 24 hours. So that's an option as well. Um, there are free videos that we make available, including this 101 series on YouTube. And then there's the student negotiations and student writing competition that ELS hosts every year. We also have a book club, uh, diversity inclusion fellowships that you can apply for. And then we have several awards that you can nominate people for both at, with ELS and with the new lawyers section, including Lifetime Achievement Award. There's a tra Trailblazer Award that's new this year within the Environmental Law section. And then there's the Jack Berman Award of Achievement, which is a award for a young lawyer that's been given out ever since 1992. Um, you can check our job boards out as well. Uh, and then we have a mentorship program that recruits new participants in the fall every year. Uh, one other plug, obviously, is just to follow the Environmental Law section and, and the New Lawyers section on social media, and free, feel free to reach out to us there. We have LinkedIn, Instagram, and X. Next slide, please. Uh, 
By way of introductions, my name is Nick Oliver, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm currently Assistant General Counsel at Elevate, which is a Chicago-based energy and climate justice nonprofit. Uh, prior to joining Elevate, I spent five years as an attorney with the California Energy Commission and worked on a wide variety of energy programs, including renewable portfolio standards, appliance efficiency standards, building decarbonization programs, and power plant siting. Uh, I also serve on the executive committee of the environmental law section, and I'm the chair for the energy committee. Uh, I also was formerly chair of the new lawyer section. Uh, John McKinsey will be our instructor and featured panelist today. Mr. McKinsey's practiced energy law since 1999 and has taught energy law at the School of Law at UC Davis since 2011. He regularly writes and speaks on energy law and policy and has gained significant applied science knowledge and skills while serving in the US Navy on submarines and as a nuclear power plant operator and supervisor and leading electrician. Just some housekeeping items before we begin. I will reserve some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please submit your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom and I'll read those aloud after John's presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Environmental Law Section's 101 page uh, within a few weeks, as well as on YouTube. And the slide deck was sent by email to the registered attendees earlier this morning. It will also be available on the 101 website. So now I will pass it over to your instructor, John McKinsey. John, thank you so much for joining us today and please take it away. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so a couple of comments about the slides before we get going you'll see a few surprises and a few different things in the slides I'm presenting. It's partly designed to keep you alert a little bit. And sometimes some of the graphic things that I do get in the way of text. And so, uh, but generally the, the slides you have have almost all the content we're gonna see. Second comment about that, I, I compressed a lot of material that I teach over the course of a semester, not all of it, into one hour. And there are a few things I included that I really won't go over very thoroughly but I wanted them to be in the slide deck so you'd have that information available to you. And, and so ultimately where we end up after about one hour will should be at the end, but you'll see I'll move by a few things a little faster to get us there. So to start with, uh, this, this set of slides almost entirely come out of my lecture slides that have evolved over the last 13 years. And I almost always start with something like this showing just sources of energy, the sun in the center, a clump of coal, on the left and uh, an oil derrick on the right. You can't really put a picture of oil on the screen because it just looks like a black circle. So an oil derrick works a little bit better. Uh, and the, the concept behind that is that's where we get our energy from. And the, and the topic we're getting into is the law and policy surrounding it. So a rough outline of where we're going is we're gonna talk about energy generally. So we understand the background and the, and the framework that you really need to understand to understand the policies, the laws, the issues, the regulatory efforts surrounding energy. Then we're gonna work our way into the, the human world of energy, the energy sectors where we get our energy from, what we use it for. And then we're gonna target what are, is the primary things going on in the electricity world. They're both in electricity, but one of them connects to the transportation sector. And that's, we're trying to transform the electricity sector and particularly in California to be renewable and competitive. And uh, we're also now attempting to electrify the transportation sector. And that's where most of the current issues, law and policy reside. And so that's our trip that we will take over, over this hour to work our way through energy law and policy 101. I like this slide to explain a little bit more of what's going on. Um, and sometimes I animate this one, but I didn't want to today. The reason I explain the word energy is that we really don't regulate energy per se, we're regulating what people can do with energy, but that's true for almost all laws. And, but you still have to understand that because there's only so many things we can do with energy. I can't tell people to do something that physics won't allow me to do. And so the laws of physics limit our ability to regulate energy because people can't do those things. And then down here at the bottom, I've got the three main change forces that are pushing their way through the practice of law, uh, the making of it, the enforcement of it, uh, everything, which is the environmental push, which we've had for, we could say since the 1970s, but it really picked up steam um, a little later, the sustainability movement, which is uh, essentially at this point has become the greenhouse gases component to it. But it was around before that when we just called it renewable energy for other reasons. And then finally, a modernization effort. We're trying to transform the grid into what we can do with it. And technology has given us a lot of new options and abilities to do things that we never thought possible. Those are the change forces. They're driving the policy, which makes this circle, drives the law, 
which then drives the regulation. The policy might directly drive regulation or it might create laws which drive the regulation. That's what energy law is about, are those three things, law, policy, and regulation. So this long title is a better one, the law, regulation, and policy governing how persons can produce, distribute, and consume energy. Though I already gave you a lie with the word consume because we really don't consume it. If we looked at it in substantive areas, there's a rights component to it. Uh, some of it's very specialized. We talked about oil and gas as property law. It's a, a special body of law. But we often even get into the issue of who has the right to harness the wind crossing over their property and how much, things like that. Impacts law is environmental law and land use law. A lot of lawyers that are practicing in energy law, they think of themselves as environmental lawyers or land use lawyers doing development and permitting. There's utility law, which is the closest thing we have to something you would call energy law, because it's entirely about regulating the thing called a utility. And one of the things we do with utilities is we use them to deliver a lot of our electricity and a lot of our natural gas. And so the regulation of utilities is, is essentially the regulation of energy. And then finally, business law. There's a tremendous amount of work going on, and we'll see why it, for business lawyers and contracts lawyers and transactional lawyers in the energy sector because of what we're doing. It's not entirely regulatory work. All right, so if we looked at what the science of energy really is, the, the biggest one is that first one on the list, physics, and in particular, energy physics. There's also chemistry, and in fact, combustion is a chemical process, and so a significant way that we've made energy most of our our, our industrial experience has, and even our human experience, has been combustion, a chemical process. And then the mechanics and engineering and material science that allows us to do things like build solar panels, build power plants, build transmission lines, what we can and can't do. You don't really have to understand all that science. The ones that you need to understand is really the first two. There are things about physics and chemistry you have to understand to effectively work in the energy sector as a lawyer. <clears throat> So this is, it might sound like the most useless definition you've ever seen in your life, uh, but it's the best one. Uh, energy is the potential that something has. So this ability to make something happen works really good as a definition, even though it seems like, well, how do I regulate this ability? But we have to measure it and we have to then say, uh, we understand it. Well, the something we can figure out, it's warmth, sounds, light, and motion. Pretty much that's what we're trying to do. We're either trying to create warmth, sound, light, or motion, with something we call an energy source. And so we measure it by how much it could produce of those things. A real common measure would be if you took some source of energy, that clump of coal, 20 minutes of a solar panel in front of some, some solar radiation, how much could it do? How much electricity could it, how many electrons could it move? How much warmth could I get out of burning the clump of coal? We often measure it that way. And a great example of that is the calorie. Um, besides something that we try to reduce so we don't gain weight, its technical definition is that it's enough heat energy to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. We also have the British thermal unit, which is our, our British English system equivalent of the calorie used in its units. All right, another really important concept we have to understand is when we talk about using energy, we're not really consuming it or we can destroy it with e equals MC squared and turn it into something else. But really what we're doing is we're converting it from one form to another. And, and these conversions, every time we convert energy from one form to another, we lose some of it. It mostly is heat that goes out into the atmosphere around, sometimes as little particles. Uh, but this is a really important concept to understand because it drives the idea that one of the things we wanna do is minimize conversions of energy because every time we convert it, whatever we had in that clump of coal, we lost some of what was available. Every hour that solar panel ran, if we convert the electricity too many times, we don't get as much work out of it at the other end. Eventually we lose all of the energy. There are examples of things we're coming up with and a great example is dynamic braking in electric cars and hybrids where we actually take some of the kinetic energy of the car and put it back into a battery. But eventually we lose all that energy and you have to put more into a system. So again, keep that thought in mind, minimize conversions because every time we convert, we lose some of it. <clears throat> From a human user perspective, not really a physics perspective, it's how we've come about, we divide the energy sectors into these three sectors, electricity, heating, and transportation. Depending on the nature of those sectors, some are synonymous with just one thing. For most of our history, transportation in our modern history, it's been synonymous with oil. Uh, mostly heating, heating early on was a lot of coal. Today, it's becoming increasingly natural gas, and, it's, and we started as we invented electricity relying on it. 
electricity itself as a sector, we, we make from a lot of different places and we use it for a lot of different things. Really briefly, and these are things I'm not gonna to spend too much time on, but if you didn't know it before, electricity is the movement of electrons on a conductor. And we'll talk a little more about that when we talk about its strengths and weaknesses. And the little units I gave you up in the top are these words and like watt plus kilowatt, megawatt, gigawatt, that, uh, and then down here, watt hour that you will hear and come across that you have to understand what they are. The watt is a measurement of the flow and the watt hour is a measurement of the total amount of energy that flowed. And so we multiply the watt by time and came up with a really creative name, watt hour, instead of some fancy name after somebody. We got the watt part, James Watt, but not the hour. The heating sector, we understand it. It's, it's to make heat for two things though. One is for our own needs as humans, the farther north or south we go towards the poles, the more we have to heat to take care of ourselves. But we also use heat for all sorts of processes, a lot of industrial processes. And, uh, and so heat in its sector is a mixture of, of what we think of heating a building, heating a house, and, and even maybe you might think of heating your food, but that's an industrial process. We use that a lot. Without heat, we can't make beer, for example. Finally, the transportation sector, I think we all know what it is, but it's important to remember it's two things. It's moving us and moving goods. And uh, I have in bold right down here near the bottom, a very big thing that is happening now is the electrification of the transportation sector. When I first started teaching energy law in 2011, I had barely a half an hour of, of material on the transportation sector. In the last, say, three to five years, transportation is becoming a larger and larger focus because of this effort to try to electrify the transportation sector. Um, so that's focused on the human side of how we divide it. We also need to focus a little bit on the sources, and we've heard most of them before. I like these two charts in the comparison. They're very useful. On the left, we have sources of energy, and on the right, we have the sectors. This is the Energy Information Administration, a federal agency that puts out a report for every year, a lot of data. And this is 2011. You can see that on the left, petroleum, the red square, about a third of our energy came from petroleum, a little over a quarter from natural gas, about a fifth from coal, uh, about 9% from renewable energy, most of which was hydro, and 8% uh, from nuclear power. The arrows tell you the percents that went to these sectors, transportation, industrial, residential, and electric power. So I can see, for instance, that 71% of all petroleum went to the transportation sector, where it provided 93% of the transportation sector's energy needs. Obviously, as we see things change, we expect that to change. We go forward to 2021, and you might notice something changed. This black box that was electrical power in the bottom right has now become its own space. This is the first year that the EIA started showing this, and it's a really important thing to notice what's happening besides the changes. But you might notice oil is still about a third, pretty much 90% uh, of the transportation sector. Uh, natural gas has grown in size and coal has shrunk. So natural gas went from a quarter to about a third. Coal has shrunk down to 11% in 2021. The renewable energy sector went up 3% and that was pretty much solar and some wind. But the other big change is they pulled out electricity as a sector and they show it as a transitional place where all these sources of energy are coming from the left and going to the use end. And the really key thing to understand about this is this black box at the bottom. 65% of all the electricity we make is lost before it actually goes to use. We only get about a third of our electricity in use. And we'll touch on a little bit why that is, but it's a very important thing to understand when we talk about increasing our dependency on electricity in the transportation sector, we've got to grapple with the fact that we would look at this and say it's very inefficient. And that means for every kilowatt of hour of electricity I need on the transportation side, I'm going to need three of them on the generation side. This is my incredibly good job using PowerPoint and my mastery of squares and, and things to create a little chart of understanding the interaction between these sectors. I've got three red squares for the sectors and I've got these pink boxes that I call the temporary sources because that's what they are. We're using them up at a rate much faster than the earth makes them. And so we will eventually run out of coal, gas, oil, and even fission because we will run out of uranium-235, plutonium-238, unless we start mining it on a few planets that have a lot of it. So even it's a limited source. And so that's the best way to describe them as temporary sources. And then under electricity, I've got these uses just to understand because the heating sector, it's straightforward, it's heat. Transportation is transportation. 
We rely on electricity for lighting, motors, electronics, and heat. And uh, I'm gonna get that out of the way, but that's an important concept. We also send a lot of electricity to the heating sector. And that's why it's one of its uses. That's another form of very inefficient heating. So if all the electricity we send to the heating sector, heating with electricity is not the ideal way to go for energy efficiency purposes. And then we could say we're sending electricity into the transportation sector for cars. Finally, I would note that we do send what we call something from the heating sector. If we think of the heating sector as being nothing but the petroleum sector, it's also the natural gas sector. And we can send compressed natural gas or CNG into the transportation sector for cars. So that's what we had until we started discovering other things. We've been harnessing wind for a long time, the permanent sources. And I put photovoltaics, thermal, that's uh, photothermal, so thermal use of the sun's energy, hydro and wind, all is sun energy because that's where we really get it from. The sun is depositing its radiation on the earth. The wind is created by an uneven heating of the earth. And directly it causes evaporation of water, which gives us hydro electricity later when it comes out and thermal and solar voltaics. Gravity, we rely on gravity as well. The, the interaction between the moon and the earth helps us build tides, can even help a little bit with other things. Uh, and without gravity, we obviously, but that's a different kind of gravity, hydro wouldn't work. And then finally, geothermal, heat coming from the center of the earth. Technically, we could say that geothermal is not a permanent source because the core is cooling down as it crystallizes. Uh, and isotopes decay. But we could also say that about the sun. The sun's only gonna be around for about 4 billion years. So nothing really lasts forever, but I think even geothermal is beyond our event horizon. Now, here's the other thing that's now gonna be happening. We're trying to get more electricity out of the electricity sector and in the transportation sector. Here in California, we could say even more. And really where we're headed is that these things like gas, which we rely on, are gonna be replaced by the sun. And really, Ultimately, the sun largely, and some gravity and geothermal, is going to replace all of these temporary sources. And so we're going to have this giant transformation of the electricity sector, displacing what we rely on the oil in the transportation sector. So you could immediately say, well, the sectors are about the same size. We're going to have to double the size of the electricity sector to electrify the transportation sector. But the math I'll show you a little later, it's more than that. All right, so I told you electricity was flow of electrons. It's wonderful because it gives us a near instantaneous movement of energy from one location to another. It's incredible. It, I like to say it moves at the speed of light. It's not quite accurate, but it moves close to that. So the light that you see coming from the light bulbs above your head was something else just a little while ago. And here in California right now, invariably, it was probably solar radiation because right now our solar radiation is at its peak for the day and we're depending on it more than anything else. <laughs> At its starting and ending point, electricity is converted from something to another thing. We don't really consume electricity. And so the electricity is lighting up the screen on your monitor, lighting up our room, running some fans, and running the electronics in your computer. And all of those conversions happen very instantly. So you really never see the electricity. And so we can really only say the electricity exists momentarily, barely even a moment for some electricity. And but we still are able to talk about it as this continuous flow. And so we end up thinking of it as a commodity that's sitting there, but we're really, it's a commodity that's moving at close to the speed of light. You know most of this information about the sources, similar to what you saw earlier. I wanna emphasize something that hydropower, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, falls in different categories. Here in California, large hydropower is not considered renewable under the meaning of it, but it's still, and, and it has to do with a little bit of the, the dig between what renewable should be. Is it sustainable energy or is it green energy? And a lot of people would say hydropower, the damming up of natural habitat is not very green, even if we could call it something we could do forever. The almost always renewable is hydro when it's considered to be a renewable source and then wind, solar, and geothermal. And I have at the bottom in quote storage. We'll talk about that topic briefly, but that's the new challenge. But I'll tell you right now, it's a lie. It's why it's in quotes. We don't store electricity we convert it into something else like chemical energy and then pull it back out into electricity again. So storage is really a place where we can store something else and we can get the electricity into that other form and then convert it back. All right, so it's strengths. Uh, instantaneous delivery is a big strength, but that leads to a weakness. And also its impacts are at the point of creation. It allowed us to put large giant power plants out away from people, not worry about the pollution from them, send the electricity in on wires and people use the electricity without thinking of the pollution associated with their electricity. Big weakness, huge problem. 
we have to make it in real time to meet demand. There really is no storage, though, again, we have this storage movement we'll talk about. So we have to operate the grid every day trying to make sure if somebody turns on a light bulb adding another load, there's another light bulb's worth of energy ready to come out on, uh, when they need it. Uh, second, all this creation and use involves wasteful conversions. We saw that two thirds of all electricity we make doesn't make it into a use. And it requires, and it required, it required a massive infrastructure to make and deliver it in the first place. And it's requiring essentially a new one in order to convert it over to the wh where we see the future going. So there's essentially a massively new infrastructure project that, that California and a few other states and a few places in the world are aggressively tackling and almost everybody's talking about tackling. A few more data points. Uh, lurking in here, you see the sources of US electricity, another fact chart from the EIA. And you notice there's our hydro at 7.3%, wind at eight, solar at 2.3% biomass at 1.4. The one that's growing is the solar. Uh, we've tapped into a lot of the wind that's available. There is a growth in wind, but where we see the huge growth potential is solar. And then two comparisons of California, 2013, big giant blue is natural gas. So we were about two thirds natural gas for our electricity. If we had gone back uh, 20 years before that, we would have seen oil and coal, which is lurking in some of the other, the 7.1 was a slightly larger role. But we've, we've been using a lot of natural gas to displace oil and electricity generation for our original efforts under the Clean Air Act. And then you see a small, nice 6.6 .6 sliver of wind, uh, a big 12.2 of hydro, and solar is so small in 2013, it's also lurking over here in the other. Uh, finally, we jump forward and natural gas has gone from 58 to 43. Solar has now emerged in just that short time of five years, we went to 19% of our electricity coming from solar. That's a tremendous accomplishment. And the meanwhile, hydro is still sitting about where it was. Uh, wind is sitting about where it was. And what shrank was natural gas. So what you see is solar displacing natural gas. Uh, last of these setup type concepts, the electricity sector is made up of three places of its own. The generation, the transmission, and the distributions, yellow bar across the top. Generation, you can think of as the manufacturing, if we're looking at a traditional uh, industrial sector. Transmission is the distribution. And then we use the word distribution in electricity, but we're really talking about retail. So when you see the word distribution, it's not the movement of electricity from the maker to the consumer. It's really the local selling of the electricity and the local movement of it. And then we have a bunch of terms here. We're going to come to some of them. The, the terminology we use for power plants, the terminology we use in the transmission world and uh, in the distribution world. Okay, uh, basic concept is the concept of a utility, which is something that we invented a long time ago, starting in transportation, primarily with bridges and, and boat service over water. The idea is we give somebody a, a monopoly, an exclusive right to be the sole provider of some type of thing. And one of the things we use utilities for almost across the entire earth is to deliver electricity to customers. We give somebody the sole right because we decided competition is not a good idea. And, and so we have utilities. There are two types of utilities. The privately owned utility, which is often called an IOU, which stands for investor owned utility. We're in pg and &E service territory, or I am. Around California, you're likely to be in, a, in an investor owned utility right now. It's territory where it is the exclusive provider of electricity. A lot of states are predominantly IOUs, including California, which I, as you note, I note it's about four fifths of our electricity. Utility case law focuses primarily on the issues associated with granting somebody monopoly power. So we need to regulate them for price and quality to, because they don't have to compete and, uh, and, and safety for things like electricity. So they do it in effective prices, they do it um, safely and they deliver electricity consistently, for instance. There's another type of utility often called a muni, which is short for municipal. And a municipal utility is where we allow government to do it. In the United States, not all utilities are privately owned. And in some states such as Kansas, it's almost entirely municipal energy, which is essentially a branch, sub branch of state in the United States. We also have a concept we'll sometimes talk about national power where a country as a whole runs the grid. They haven't even allocated it out to local segments of the government. A, a lot of countries have a national power model or they have an IOU competing with some national power model. I gave you this map, which is really handy. 
It gives you an idea. The white is PG&E's large service territory. The yellow is Southern California Edison's. The purple in the bottom left corner is San Diego Gas and Electric. Those are our three major investor-owned utilities. There's a couple of small ones that creep over the border from other states like Pacific Core up here in the blue. Everything else here is what we would call a muni, a municipal utility. And uh, the, the largest ones we can identify right away are SMUD, not too far away from where I'm sitting right now, and down in Los Angeles, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. <clears throat> and they're also very urban areas. So they're pretty big players as utilities go in California. <clears throat> Last term that we have to understand is the concept of an independent power producer. We have utilities, the municipal investor owned, an independent power producer came into creation because of the oil crises when we passed a law called PURPA, the Public Utilities Regulatory Policy Act in 78. And it was focused was on trying to create a movement towards more efficient energy and what we call renewable energy. First time you see that term really showing up. PURPA didn't really have a big effect overall in terms of significantly changing the source of, of where we got electricity and making a lot of it renewable. And the renewable effort kind of faded out in the mid eighties until it came back. But PURPA's big impact was it required the utilities to purchase electricity from anybody who made these qualifying types of electricity. They were called qualifying facilities or QFs. So it brought suddenly this investment opportunity because no longer did the utilities have a stranglehold over the making of electricity. If you build it, they had to buy it and under some set terms. So what that created was the concept of an independent power producer or IPP. And what we now see, it also kind of caused us to go down a path that we might have had to, but we almost rely entirely in the United States on IPPs to make all of our renewable electricity. There's not a lot of effort to say, hey, utility, go out there and, and build some solar panels and shut down your power plant. Instead, we're saying, go contract with somebody to build those solar panels. And this is really all caused by the direction we took with PURPA in 1978. So if this is a chart of what we call the vertically integrated utility. It owns its generation it owns its transmission and it owns its distribution. It owns all three sectors. And this was our model that we built this nation on with electricity starting in the 19, we call it the 19 teens, much more steam, no pun intended in the twenties. This was our model until we started playing with it very, very recently. And the very first time was the idea of creating IPPs that will take away a piece of that generation. And so, now the utility is not making all of its generation, it's buying some from an IPP. And it's, it's the beginning of cracks showing around the concept of our vertically integrated utility. Started in 78, but in 78, this wasn't a very big wedge. It's growing and in a place like California, it's grown almost all the way across. But uh, in almost every state now, we see the effect of IPPs clawing away some of the generation of utilities. I gave you this lineup of the change forces, which we saw earlier, we really have three paths that we can go down to try to, to react to these change forces. Go to renewable energy, create competition because we think it'll help and efficiency efforts. The lowest hanging, un, unsexiest, unfunnest, boringest area, but most important is efficiency. Uh, we've made tremendous strides. And in fact, California, in fact, the California Energy Commission has made tremendous strides in finding ways to make things more efficient that is spread through the country and even some cases through the world. And we're still finding ways to get more and more efficiency out of the way we consume energy. But our main focus right now is on finding ways to make more renewable energy and figuring out how to deal with competition. The barriers to these changes are cost, a lot of the renewable sources are more expensive than oil. They're not a, naturally a market-driven uh, outcome. The lack of dispatchability, a term we'll see briefly, and then the basic concept of change. I'll tell you, in the, I have two types of change. There's the institutional. It's the utilities that didn't want to change, and some still don't want to change, and then our own desire to not change. And when we talk about the, the, the electrification of the transportation sector, we have a cultural resistance of people that that like the, the concept of filling up a car really fast with gas and not the idea of having to plug it in. And that's cultural resistance to change. All of that is resulting in two things happening right now, renewable electricity and competition. I gave you this list of the types of renewable electricity and I wanna call your attention to the second word here, which talks about whether it's dispatchable or not. 
dispatchable. I often remind people if they're old enough or go to a really old diner of the old wheel that sits there behind the, the counter where they put the ticket on and spin it around for the cook to pull it off to make food, dispatching somebody to do something. And that's where the idea comes from. And what we mean by dispatchable is I can tell the power plant what level of power I want out of it. And the, the, the joy of gas as well as even coal and oil is I just press a throttle and I can turn it up and turn it down. We built our grid on the idea of having dispatchable power that I can turn up and down as people turn on and off their blenders and their TVs and, and, and their hot tub heater comes on. Wind is not dispatchable and it's actually described in terms of how it is as intermittent because it doesn't follow a particular period. Solar PV and solar thermal are described as periodic. That box right there of patterns is what's driving a lot of our efforts to figure out how we can make ourselves more and more renewable. Is going over from something like the combustion gas turbine, base load, running up all this power we need that we can turn it whatever to these sources of energy. <clears throat> so if we looked macro policy economics class or something like that, we could give, here are the ways we could do this if we wanna build all these renewable electricity facilities. The government could build and operate it. Local utility could develop it. An independent power producer could develop it and sell power to the utility, or a consumer could develop it to offset their bill, di directly making their own power. And no surprise at this point, we're almost entirely depending on IPPs to develop it and sell the power to the utility, uh, which means we also now have a financial industry, uh, a contracting industry, all sorts of other aspects to this that all drive this ability to, to allow independent power producers to build and sell power to utilities. RPS, which stands for Renewable Portfolio Standard, is the tool that the United States has chosen to use in order to accomplish this change. So the idea is that they passed a law that tells utilities, you will get a certain amount of your electricity from the things we tell you are allowable that we'll call renewable. Uh, this isn't the only model. Europe and Canada rely on another model called the feed-in tariff which we have little hints of in the United States, but primarily the model we use to try to force change is to go to the utilities, which control the end users and require that they get enough of their electricity and increasing amounts. It's usually expressed on an annual basis. That's a really important concept to understand. And it's as a percentage of the total energy delivered. This allows you to make more electricity uh, from sources like the sun during the summertime when you have longer days and more sunny days, and as long as you come out at the end of the year on an annual basis, okay. But that's gonna create a challenge as we wanna to get to higher and higher levels of penetration. Uh, second thing to understand is most RPS laws around the country lack meaningful enforcement. We call them toothless. And even our own RPS, when we first started it, it seemed like we weren't making any progress at all until uh, utilities kind of got the hint, you, you, better, you better start doing better or you're going to have some consequences. As If you go to this website I listed right here, uh, desireusa.org, um, it has a great chart. They keep it pretty current. Click on every state and see exactly what their RPS requirements are. California, 33% by 2020 that, uh, uh, that were there. 60% is our new threshold we're trying to get to by 2030. And then we have 100%, but we've already realized we're gonna to have to start talking about something else. So our 100% goal by 2045 includes what we'll call zero carbon energy. Idea being, for instance, we may be able to offset it. Uh, we may get more comfortable calling large hydro zero carbon. Oregon, it's 25% by 2025, 50% by 2040. It applies only to large IOUs. In California, we applied it only to IOUs until we made our next big change. And now it applies to municipal utilities as well, but it didn't early on. Arizona, it's 15% by 2025, Maine, 40% by 2017. And if we dug into a lot of states, we might find, well, there's not a lot of real consequences if the utility doesn't achieve 15% uh, by that year. In other states, there are. So the RPS is our model we're using. We were 33% in 2020. When we up to the next level, we brought munis under the regulation and we brought them under the regulation of a different, a different agency. The IOUs are regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission. You'll see this in a moment on the next slide. Um, and they would use requests for offers and an auction mechanism and then negotiate the contracts. And then the CPUC approves them. Munis, when they became subject to the RPS as well, when California got even more serious, they have a lot more flexibility because they're a governmental agency. They still have some procurement rules, but they don't have anybody that really regulates them, like approves their contracts. 
where they came under regulation is ARB in, in basically showing that they're accomplishing their goals and they have to report that to the CEC, how much percent. And so ARB has this ability to penalize the muni. Munis did not, a lot of the munis did not go very willingly into the RPS world and it took a lot of these type of things to really push them. And, and now they're largely understanding it and trying to achieve it. We're now 60% by 2030 and then 100% by 2050. All right, uh, this is a list of the three main agencies that regulate electricity in California. I've mentioned the California Energy Commission already. Uh, they primarily cite power plants. They, originally it was thermal power plants only. And now there's an opt-in option for renewable facilities that want to also get CC permitting. The idea is the Energy Commission offered a one-stop or at least a, some type of a, a more streamlined, but the real power of it is that the Energy Commission often can act a lot more objectively about the state's interests and not a little less on the local interest in saying, we don't want this here, go away. They also, as Nick noted, have had a huge role in appliance and building efficiency standards. They also do a lot of energy policy work. They also encourage a lot of development. The Public Utilities Commission regulates investor-owned utilities, and starting with the law about 15, 18 years ago, got some authority over the generators themselves. But they really primarily only regulate, and only regulate it anyway, the utilities themselves, and mostly for price and safety and quality. And then a new agency we invented about 20 years ago, coming out of a federal law that encouraged states to do this, is our independent system operator, the California Independent System Operator, or CAISO, as it's often called. And they regulate the transmission system to the extent that the utilities have volunteered to allow the ISO to take them over. And there are a couple of utilities that notably have not allowed CAISO to take over the operation of their grid. And so they still do it on their own. Most of the California grid is operated by CAISO. And so the CAISO is now essentially telling the utilities what they can or can't do with their transmission system. They are overseen by, they're not an agency, um, but they are overseen by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So the other transformation that happened when we did this is we gave the federal government a big chunk of, of ability to tell us what we can and can't do in our state with transmission. I gave you this incredibly good chart that's so easy to read, I know. Green, federal jurisdiction on top, and pink, I guess, salmon, uh, state jurisdiction on the bottom, across the middle are those three sectors. And you can see, for instance, <clears throat> the California Independent System Operator has some regulatory authority over transmission companies and some over uh, the, the generators themselves, IPPs and utilities. Air Resources Board has some authority over in the utilities and has some authority over the generators. The Public Utilities Commission regulates IOUs could have a little arrow pointing all the way over to, to generators for the authority they have on them. And then finally, I note the California Energy Commission, uh, and I have it pointing at the generators. It doesn't really regulate them. They're uh, other than the ones that they permitted and developed, and then they are. They, they have a permit they have to comply with, but there's a lot of sources of generation of electricity that are not regulated by the Energy Commission. They're a local land use permitted system. And then I have the arrow pointing over here for munis, because that's the muni authority that they have to, they now do the work to oversight the munis correctly reporting their renewable energy portfolio standard accomplishments. So we have this myriad of federal and state agencies and all these players running around in the middle. And then a list of some of those other agencies that regulate these sources of energy or the consequences. The Air Resources Board is primarily focused on these days, greenhouse gas, but they've always long been fo focused on all the other combustion-based sources of emissions, and they come out of the Federal Clean Air Act. They also set some fuel and combustion standards, which are significantly important for the local air districts and agencies that have to work under them with some degree of an independent authority. We have land use commissions that drive a lot of the decision-making if that land use is territory is involved in the permitting or development of an asset, and then local land use agencies. So most of your small solar facilities and, and wind facilities are largely permitted by the counties or the cities that they are in. Uh, one other agency of note that's a relatively new agency that replaced an old agency to become a little more focused on geology, but originally they focused on oil and gas wells, and that's CalGEM is the easiest way to describe it. There are longer ways to say they're the Geologic Energy Management Division of the California Department of Conservation, which is why it's a lot easier to say CalGEM. So they have a pretty relevant 
authority right now related to the development and use of ge geologic wells. What's missing on that list, of course, is something like a water-based well. All right, so what California wants to accomplish is they want to electrify the transportation sector by 2035. Uh, at the same time, it wants to make the electricity sector renewable or carbon free. And at the same time, it wants to change the role and structure of utilities. And that's something we're trying to do right now. This means a lot of change that's happening and a lot more change that will happen. But I give you the basic thing, some amount of renewable energy generation has to get built. Some amount of storage capacity has to get built and some amount of hydrogen infrastructure. This is almost more on some people's opinions. The only way we're gonna get there is to, to tap into one convenient thing we can do, which is make hydrogen from solar electricity. Um, so this is the number that the, the transportation sector in California consumed in 2020. And notice it's BTUs, British thermal units, because it involves, uh, instead of a uh, watt, it involves uh, a liquid energy, and so we measure it by British thermal units, 3 trillion BTUs. The number in the electricity sector in California was 272,000 gigawatt hours. That's the amount of energy that same year. If we did a little conversion on the math between these two things, we'd see that uh, converting all those BTUs to gigawatt hours gives us about 900,000 gigawatt hours of, of transportation energy. If we convert this 3 trillion, so we add those together and we're going to need about 1.1 quadrillion gigawatt hours of, did I say that right? No, trillion, one point, yeah, because I'm at my gigawatt hours. That in the electricity sector, in order to, to continue to support the electricity sector and also support the transportation sector. So it's, it's not really a doubling the size of the electricity sector when you look at it from a total amount of energy. It's a little more like a four to five times multiplication of the transportation sector. Uh, that's how big the and en the energy sector is uh, in terms of total energy. Second, we have to talk about a something called the capacity factor, which we don't have much time to talk about. But the idea is, wind and solar. If I have a one megawatt capable facility, is maybe going to average twenty to thirty two percent on average over the course of a year. So we don't get all of out what it's capable of. And so if we use a thirty percent capacity factor. Uh, what we actually figure out is that we need about 446 gigawatts of renewable electricity in order to make the electricity sector renewable and also electrify the transportation sector. But we haven't, uh, here's the factor lurking in all this. Right now we have about 38.2 gigawatts of renewable energy generating capacity. This is a year old slide, so it should have gone up a little. So you can see the difference here between 446 and 38. We have a lot of electricity to make that we're gonna find to be acceptable. This math got worked out by myself and a few engineers when we were trying to get to another number. It was a rule of thumb you would hear people throw out all the time and we decided to figure out if it was true or not, which is some people would say, if we're gonna do all this stuff in California, we're gonna have to cover an area the size of Connecticut with solar panels. <laughs> and it turns out it was pretty accurate because 400 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity. Uh, and since we're at 12.7, uh, we've got to multiply it by a lot. We need about 31 times, one megawatt, uh, per 2.8 acres, 2.8 acres for solar, uh, tells us we need to cover about 1.1 million acres, convert them over to being covered with solar panels. And that's about one one hundredth of California's land area, about three times the area of the city of Los Angeles. And guess what? It's about the size of the state of Connecticut. So somebody else had done this math before and started that line running around. And it's it tells you just the scale of electricity. Uh, but uh, we're going to have something else <laughs> and that's storage, because in addition, there's going to be a tremendous amount of work to, to create all of this ability to keep electricity flowing at, say, midnight when the sun isn't shining. And so another factor, in addition to building the capacity to make all this electricity, is how much storage we're also going to have to build. There's a lot more debate around this, but as California gets to 30 and then 40 percent and 50 percent, the idea is we expect that we're going to have to build more and more storage proportionate to the amount of electricity we add, because we're going to need to move more and more of that electricity to other times of the day. So some analysts have said it, it, it's going to become a one-to-one -one ratio. For every gigawatt of electricity you add after 50, you might need one gigawatt of storage. But there's a lot of debate on this. But at a minimum, we know this bottom line right here, we're going to have to develop a lot of storage to shift solar energy to nighttime availability. All right, so back to this slide I gave you, the vertically integrated utility regulated if it's an IOU by the 
California Public Utilities Commission. Almost every state has its form of a utilities commission to regulate these utilities. This was our model we built it on. Where we're headed, and in California, we really attempted to get there entirely 20 years ago, is to the partially vertical utility where they've gone out of the generation business entirely. And the generation sector is entirely made up of IPPs and it's competitive and they're bidding to sell the electricity so that then the partially vertical utility that runs its transmission grid is distribution grid. But we could take that even farther and we'd see that there's also a uh, movement, it's happening a lot slower to gradually take out the utility from being the operator of the grid itself. And, and that would put them into being just electricity distributor down there at the bottom, delivering electricity to their ratepayers. That takes us to a topic that gives you an idea of how other things are changing. Another experiment that California has just started not too long ago that's taken, uh, it's taken a huge effect is the concept of a CCA. Most of us have heard that acronym. The CCA can stand for two things. It can stand for community choice aggregation, the movement or the cause, or it could be the thing, the entity doing it, the, the, the actual uh, facility that we would also call a CCA. So you'll hear CCA being used as the movement or as one of these places. The idea is, and it's really only something that became a doable with our modern computer technology, of allowing a, a local county or city, some type of local jurisdiction to say, if you want, you can have us be the procurer of your electricity instead of having the utility get it for you. And we'll offer you other types of electricity. We'll give you an entirely green package or a 50% green package. It was born out of the idea that they felt the utilities weren't moving fast enough and perhaps weren't trusted enough. And so we're gonna give these local areas the right to have customers opt out. The customers don't opt out of being served by the utility, only to have the utility procure their electricity, something that wouldn't have been doable 20 years ago, but is completely today. The CCA goes around figuring out when and how much electricity they need to make available and end up making sure that it's transmitted all the way to the utility's jurisdictional territory. And then the utility does the job of delivering it, also does all the billing. You'd think this sounds really complicated, uh, but it's actually done really effectively well so far. Uh, what they allow is an investor-owned utility ratepayer to get out of their territory for generation purposes. A bit like saying, we're gonna give you a form of a muni utility because a muni essentially is already that, a governmental entity doing the procuring of electricity. So it's like, a, you could call it a partial municipalization of IOU service territories. Um, I told you this, but I wanna to get to this piece. Marin Clean Energy, is probably the best shining example of a tremendous success, but it's not the only one at this point, but it's a, a large behemoth that started Marin County and spread across other counties all the way out to where I live in the Central Valley where I could opt in and I did so that Marin Clean Energy right now is my provider of my electricity that they deliver to PG&E, which is the service territory that I'm in. They're not the only one. The city county of San Diego has decided to entirely convert over uh, so sdg &E wanted out of it, essentially, and the city and county was fine. So there is an MCE, a, excuse me, a CCA down there, the, the San Diego, that is essentially now the, the idea is to basically let that big utility entirely get out of the procurement business if everybody opts in. So this incredibly good, I know, easy to read slide is the, the possible future, especially for a place like California that's being more aggressive than anyone else where not only is the utility gotten out of, it's gotten out of everything, but just distribution. So just this box. And even then there's all this division of what used to be their dedicated, you can only get power. There's people off the grid. There's people that are now self-generating with solar panels on the roofs. And that's becoming a bigger and bigger piece. And then there's this dotted box that might happen someday where we might allow the IPP to directly sell to a customer in the territory. Right now they can't, they still have to run through this path and then we have these dotted boxes that are starting to become notably sized boxes. One up here for storage at the generation level out there on the grid for large movement of electricity uh, by the, from the generation, all the generation by IPPs, and then a big chunk of it being sold to CCAs going through the cycle and the rest being sold this way down. And then also <coughs> storage over here on the left, uh, storage at the distribution level. So there's two types of storage that we're starting to see grow where we need localized storage in areas where during the day we have a hard time getting enough electricity in there. That's what the future may look like someday. We're not anywhere, we're not that far off as you might think in California from something like this. 
All right, I gave you this list of things I didn't cover. And so you can go Google them if you've heard them and you really wanna make sure you pick up on some things. The concept of net load and the duck curve, even though I have some wonderful slides for it. Dispatchability, I actually covered that idea and I kind of covered capacity factor, but they're worth getting a better feel for exactly how we measure those things and how they work. And I briefly touched on the idea of direct access, but there's a large body of law out there and it gets into some interesting topics about what you have a right to do on your land and being told you don't have the right to have somebody else deliver electricity to you on your land. You can self-generate, but you can't buy it from someone else. If you want, you have to buy it from the utility. This concept of direct access, which is a large big picture policy concept. And then uh, the changes that California made in their deregulation experiment, AB 1890 and 1996, uh, it accomplished some things very permanently like getting our utilities largely out of the generation business. Um, but in and of itself, it's an important concept to understand both how it worked and how it didn't work. And then uh, I also didn't cover another body of all the laws that the federal government has passed over the say last 30 years to push competition into both transmission of, of gas and electricity. And then another topic I didn't touch on, climate change laws. They're driving the renewable portfolio standard movement, but in and of themselves, the Global Warming Solutions Act, which is really the law, uh, a state law is, is driving also some big factors in what types of, of things that we're able to do with the making of electricity. This is a slide I give my students every year and I update it about where all the work is. So this was the slide I gave out at the end of the, of the, of the semester last fall. And you can see there are places for lawyers, engineers, scientists, you name it everywhere and all sorts of types of entities from law firms to utilities, to independent power producers, to state agencies in different categories. It, I tell my students, uh, you will not suffer very much in finding a job in energy in California because the big truth of the matter is we've barely really scratched the surface of what we're trying to accomplish. All right, so recap really fast. Um, First, I don't want you to forget this. Our, our concept of the use of energy is converting it. And every time we convert it, we lose some of it. I often say that we really don't have a type of energy problem. My little quotes here, we have a rate of use of energy problem. And what I mean is we look at coal and we look at oil and we say it's bad. Uh, we often associate it with evilness and darkness like a Darth Vader of the world. The truth of the matter is the problem is really how much we consume of it. And if we just stopped consuming so much coal, oil, and gas, uh, we would solve everything instantly. The real problem is we have this addiction to the consumption of energy, and we got that way because it was so easy to, well, not easy, it took a lot of work, but it is pretty easy now to just simply pull more coal and oil out of the ground, pull more gas out of the ground, and ship it off into all these different places where we don't appreciate it. And the point I'm getting at with this concept that I try to hammer home every time I get a policymaker, even better, a senator stuck next to me on a plane seat for an hour, uh, our, what we really have to talk, target is our rate of consumption and reduce waste. And, and my favorite example is I like to just say, when's the last time you got in your car and drove to the store to get an ice cream sandwich? Were you really thinking about all that energy consumption? And no, because gas was cheap and it was already in your car. And you might even say, well, now I've got an electric car, but then you gotta say, wait, Every making of electricity, every source of energy has environmental consequences. And besides just trying to replace it, in fact, I don't know that really just simply replacing it, we really need to reduce our rate of consumption and use it more responsibly. And I hope nobody on the line is here from Vegas, but we could say, I mean, Las Vegas exists for a lot of awesome, fun things, but uh, it also consumes a tremendous amount of energy. So too does Disneyland and Disney World. So energy gives us this luxury of having a lot of fun and doing a lot of incredible things, but we need to become much more responsible of it. Conversions are wasteful, so good energy policy minimizes them. And uh, right here, renewable energy brings with it all sorts of challenges of its own, chief of which are its reliability. And I, I, I don't mean that in that it's not a reliable source, but from our perspective of being fully dispatchable, I can't rely on the sun giving me any electricity at two in the morning. And on any given day in the future, I can't know even how much wind is gonna come from a wind turbine unless I have a shorter term wind forecast. And then costs. And storage is looming in here as a potentially significant add-on cost. Because if we, and meanwhile, we brought down the cost of a lot of our renewable sources a lot, which has been a, another help. 
But when we start talking about having to pair it with storage, we're losing some of that cost advantage we develop unless we develop a better and better ability to store, not really the electricity, but to store that electricity in some other form. And then the elect electrification of the transportation sector has, and I'm not being uh, overly exaggerating here, tremendous pressures and stresses on the electricity sector while it's undergoing its own conversion to be a competitive renewable place. And so that's why I say that most of the work that needs to be done is not done yet. It's not even nearly done. I became an energy lawyer right when California began its, its experiment in 99. And uh, I, I, could, I could work in the energy sector exclusively for the rest of my career if I wanted to do that. I think most people that become an energy lawyer today could do that. And, and so it's a great area to do a lot of work in, but you have to understand a lot of these concepts and ideas. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. And I really wish I had the opportunity to take your class when I was in law school uh, after hearing that. So uh, we have uh, certainly some time for audience Q&A. Um, as, as a reminder, please submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom, and I'll read those aloud. Um, so far, I'm not seeing anywhere any in there. So I, I have a couple here that I could ask as I give people time to compose and, and ask their questions to the Q&A function. Um, one, I think that is important to touch on uh, and is related to some of the concepts you discussed, John, is sort of just some key definitions for practitioners of energy law. So could you speak to what a REC is or what a renewable energy credit is, as well as what a PPA or power purchase agreement is? And why are those two things important to this conversation today? Uh, so. The idea of a REC, uh, the original model for the renewable portfolio standard was that a utility would procure the renewable energy itself. And so they would have to arrange for wherever it was being made, arrange the transmission, the distribution. And of course, that would also mean that since we're requiring that they purchase it, that they'd have to have a contract to purchase that energy. That's what the contracts that we now call them, they weren't called that early on, but that's what we call them now is a power purchase agreement. That's the name for that type of a contract that is a contract for the purchase of electricity uh, for some term of often 10 years. Sometimes we're starting to see 20, but it, it's usually shorter than that because we worry a little bit about the long-term pricing of going out too far. So that was the original model, RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard. They have to buy the electricity itself, and that's going to be through a power purchase agreement. Another model has evolved, uh, another idea, which is... Uh, and I often talk about it just like you learn in property law that, that property is a bundle of rights. Well, we can look at the electricity as having a bundle of characteristics. And so the idea is to separate in, in that electricity being made by say a renewable facility and let's pick it in Wyoming. Um, and so I'm gonna separate the renewable, uh, the electricity itself from its renewable characteristics. Entirely a fiction, uh, but it's a useful one because it allows us to not have to move that electricity from Wyoming uh, because the electricity can go where the load is in Wyoming. In the meanwhile, Wyoming could sell that the characteristics of it to a state like California that's trying to become more renewable if we would allow that, that utility to qualify if they buy the, and that's the term we end up coming, a renewable energy credit for the amount of electricity they're getting. And so if we add up the total amount of kilowatt hours, it's gonna be gigawatt hours of electricity <clears throat> that a utility at the end of the year sold. And we said that 30% of it had to be renewable. We could allow them to get all of it just by buying that 30% of that large number of kilowatt hours as renewable energy credits, or uh, we could limit it. We could say, no, we're allow you to do this much. So the idea of a renewable energy credit as a concept is brilliant. It has a, a one issue, which is, well, who is gonna figure out if that electricity made somewhere else is really renewable or not? And so California, the large leader in this uh, has to say, okay, we need some other independent entity. The entity that most often a lot of people look to is an entity called Regis out of, if I remember right, it's either Utah or Denver, uh, that that's where their headquarters is. But most people that wanna generate electricity and sell it to a place like California get certified as being renewable because they're not in the state of California by Regis. And then that also allows them perhaps sell the electricity locally and sell the credits. And Regis is able to verify they're really doing that. 
because the problem with a fiction on something like a renewable energy credit is uh, how do you know you didn't sell it three times or five times or 10 times? Somebody's got to be certifying. Yep, you made that kilowatt hour of renewable electricity and you only sold that one kilowatt hour to that entity over there and then they can take credit for it. RECs are powerful because they allow regions that say don't have enough renewable energy available to let that renewable energy be built somewhere else. And instead of having to build that renewable energy facility and all those transmission lines to move it all the way into say California. The disadvantage of a REC in particular is that that's still gonna be limiting. It's not a disadvantage, it's a weakness that uh, there's not a lot of load in Wyoming for consumers of electricity. So even if you made a lot of electricity up there, it's still gonna to have to probably go somewhere to get consumed because you, you don't just make electricity, it actually has to move, it's the movement of electrons. So somebody has to be consuming it. And, and so you, you don't get out of the fact that there still has to be a market. That's another limitation for renewable energy credits is whether there's a market for just that raw electricity that's no longer called renewable because you've severed off the renewable uh, portion to it. There are other political issues that have gotten involved as well. Uh, it, California can look at it from a, wait a minute, if we build it here, we're getting jobs here. We're getting tax base here. If we let them build it in Oregon or in Nevada, we're losing some of that as well. But still there's a practicality to it that uh, kept, a lot of states like California have said, okay, we're gonna allow renewable energy credits to count towards meeting that goal. But that also gets you out of the PPA for the utility. The utility has to instead purchase the renewable energy credit. Then meanwhile, that power is gonna have to be sold somewhere else, probably also with a PPA to someone else. Got it, thank you. All right, well, the questions have been rolling in, so uh, I'll just go through them in order. Uh, First one is from Tom McHenry. It says, what, what, what do you view as the most likely and important energy laws and regulations that will need to be adopted going forward? So uh, when we talk about law and regulation at, at that level, the, the first issue is whether we limit it to California. I mean, California has adopted an awful lot of the laws it needs to adopt. But if we went outside of the borders of California, we start seeing a need for more and more other laws. And if we especially talk about the driving thrust being climate change, we have to do more than just change California. We have to change the world and we definitely have to change the country. So by far the single most incredible changing change factor would be Congress actually producing some type of a climate change law, which has not happened. If uh, we came close with the waxman Markey, I don't know if we can say close, but it's the closest we came about 10 years ago to a federal law that would have pushed us. And we've had some regulatory efforts uh, as well, the clean power plan produced by the EPA, um, but, Truth of the matter is we need that law at the national level. The other, but mostly California has done the things they need to accomplish. The Global Warming Solutions Act says we're gonna achieve, we need to probably set even higher goals for ourselves as Californians on how much, how far we can go. We're kind of doing that the other way because we're now doing things to go carbon free. And like RPS, a lot of them start as an executive order. RPS started with an executive order and then got codified. Uh, our, our goal of electrifying the transportation sector started as an executive order, then got codified. So we're pushing our way through that. And the ARB, the Energy Commission, uh, are pushing their way pretty thoroughly through a lot of the rulemaking that has to happen at that, at that level. A lot of what we have to do is uh, some of the rulemaking and some of the complexity around taking the grid to higher and higher levels of renewable electricity. And that's a, an effort ongoing at the California Public Utilities Commission to figure out what type of rules will work so we can keep the lights on when we become more and more dependent on, on non-dispatchable renewable electricity. And in that case, California, again, is ahead of the rest of the world, other than we could say Iceland and um, uh, the Philippines, which are largely renewable, but that's only because they have a huge amount of hydro and geothermal available. And, and, and and hydro and geothermal happen to be fairly dispatchable. So they don't have the same issues that the rest of the world will have getting to high levels. So California is leading the way in that state of the art part as well. Great. Uh, next question is, can you speak a little bit to how private utilities obtain revenues and profits? How are those regulated and how the current model might be changed to better align profit incentives with climate goals? So a private utility has to submit, basically we could call it a budget. Uh, in many states, they do it in a multi-year budget to provide a little more stability and say, this is what we're going to spend money on for both capital and here's our operating costs. And, and then the utility commission's big role, and it, it, it used to be stacks of paper four or five feet tall. Now it's uh, gigabytes of data 
representing documents that if you printed them would stack up that tall, detailing out, is your spending plan acceptable? And then based on that, that spending plan, what rate can you charge for the electricity? In a place like California, that's gotten more complicated as well because they're pricing out the electricity in all sorts of categories, the distribution costs, the transmission costs, your CCA, the CCA is providing the pricing cost. But the other piece to this is to understand the utility is allowed, the private utility, the, the general concept of utility law is a reasonable rate of return on its capital. So it's not supposed to make money off of its expenses. That should be a pass-through. It's, in, it's investment, what it owns, and it should get a reasonable rate of return on that. It has to be a, not a speculative rate of return because they're not in the business of speculation. They're in the business of doing something that should be very basic and, and predictable, and they don't have to take a lot of risks. One of the complexities we have now is we're pushing utilities to do a lot more new and different things. And at the same time, we wanna kind of cap them at a non-speculative rate of return. If that becomes a big problem, we'll see utilities struggling to have enough capital investment to do what they're expected. What California is doing is saying, no, we're gonna go the other way. Let's start stripping them of more and more of the things they do so that their capital comes down and more and more of that capital is owned by private entities that are just pricing it into the price of the electricity they're selling and less and less of it is out there in the capital investment. So uh, you'll hear a lot, in fact, with the rate increases, there's this talk of all this incredible unjust profit. And of course, two days ago, pg e announced their bonuses for their executives, and it always draws all this attention, but the Public Utilities Commission is regulating the utilities very carefully for that reasonable rate of return. And, uh, and so then it becomes a question of what the utility does with it. And while the numbers can seem big, it's not the highest rate of return industry, which is why I always like to say our grandparents invested in utility stocks to get the dividend payments every year, not for the growth of the stock value. When we tried our experiment with deregulation, we flipped that the other way and it didn't work very good. And, and so that's where we're at. I think I answered that. Great. Uh, next question is from Benjamin Whittle. The question is, how do you recommend gaining a firmer understanding of the physics and chemistry applicable to working in the energy law field? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there are a lot of informative pieces out there. The, if you take even start looking at these terms and issues, that list of terms I provided, for instance, say, oh, I'm going to figure out what this net load duck curve thing is. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to find a really good article presentation on it. Uh, if you're really weak on the physics side, there are some really good physics courses you can take. Um, and things online to, to kind of get a little sharper on a few of the basic parameters of the physics and the science. If you get a chance to take a class like mine, uh, it's kind of nice because we have more time to go into more of those things and accomplish more. The, um, so, so it, it, you know, there's unfortunately, or you can go get a degree, but you really don't need a science degree or engineering degree. You just need to kind of push yourself to learn those things. Participating in the rulemaking functions that the Energy Commission and less so the Public Utilities Commission and learning the meaning of acronyms. But the Energy Commission has a lot of policy-driven proceedings where you can learn a lot about the energy sector because they're also oriented towards explaining things towards the, the population. Great. Uh, next question is from Claudia Polsky. The question is, can you kindly discuss the most exciting things if any, that are going on vis-a-vis -vis DSM, which I believe is demand side management in state agencies, or behind the curtain at investor-owned utilities if they're forced to engage with them. As you note, using less energy is unsexy, but critical. All of the energy policy conversations seem to be frustratingly supply side. Thank you. Yes. It, so demand side management kind of gets pushed aside like efficiency does as something that's not very exciting because you don't see it happening even when you do it, the demand side management doesn't necessarily lower the amount of energy. So unlike efficiency, which will just reduce the amount of energy for, for what we're doing, the demand side management, what it does is it allows us in certain periods of time to control how much electricity we have to get somewhere, which can make the grid more stable. And as, as California goes to larger and larger degrees of penetration, where they're relying more and more on these non-dispatchable sources, demand side management has a larger and larger value. We've had it around in California for a long time. The, the first time I really noticed it was the Sacramento Municipal Utility Department implementing what was called peak core, where people could sign up and have their air conditioner turned off 
were turned down when they needed to save energy during the summer. That those kind of ideas have flowed out all around the state. They're they are in, they are essentially required components by the utility commissions and the municipal utilities have largely gotten in on them. Part of the challenge of getting utilities to ever do that, which to me was the most exciting point, was uh, when we told the utilities is because utilities would make money by the more electricity they had to make every day because that required more capital. We started as a policy tool, giving them a capital investment credit for money spent on creating demand side management so that they had an incentive, just like they had an incentive to make electricity to implement really effective tools to do that. The, the, what's cool today is the technology is tremendous, but there's per, an endless set of proceedings going on at the Public Utilities Commission that are debating all of this and what the right way to go is because while technology is making it incredible, it's also tremendously complicated to figure out exactly what to accomplish. Today, we think of storage as essentially a form of demand side management. Instead of curtailing the load a little bit, we pull some of this energy we've stored locally for a little while. And ideally we'd see demand side management evolve right in with storage as the overall tool we use to make the grid more stable at peak times or on a say at a day when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining and we're really getting desperate and we gotta be more careful to get all the electricity everywhere we need it to go. A um, few more here. Uh, we have a question about the definition of renewable. How do you define renewable? And isn't it better just to call something sustainable? Is it really something that you make again or, or reuse when you're saying something is renewable? Yes, you're dead on. In fact, I teach it this way. There are three meanings of the word renewable, and they they get used differently from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And the, the, the we mentioned two of them. There's a it's sustainable, uh, and then there's another one I call it the greenness component to it. And sometimes people merge those two together. They'll say the word renewable, but one of them's talking about sustainability. Somebody else is talking about renewable. So they're not even really talking about the same thing. But it turns out we often think of a lot of these things like wind or solar as being green and being sustainable. There's a third one that has lost some favor, but it was really the beginning of all this. PURPA, that law in 1978, it was about energy independence. Uh, we were worried about, we become so dependent on foreign oil that, uh, having absolutely no relation to it, we decided to make electricity renewable. So in one sense, the law made no sense, but at least on its face, it said energy independence was an important component to this idea of the definition of renewable energy as well. Today, it's mostly a mixture of those other two things. And I often ask the students, what do you think? And the question is we should, but we have no federal law uh, like we have for something like organic foods, telling the, all the states who we use the same definition and where we disagree on might be somebody might see a wind facility that's killing a lot of birds and say it's not green enough, or a solar facility that takes out too much habitat is not being green enough to be renewable. Somebody else that says, nope, it's, it's sustainable. Those solar panels will make electricity forever. Uh, that it meets their definition. And so it, where we get there is eventually governments making decisions for us. And that government is doing it based on the electorates and putting them in place. What would help would be an international standard or a national standard for the United States. But even then you're gonna see some differences, uh, hydropower and whether large hydropower, a state that has a lot of hydropower potential is gonna say large hydro absolutely ought to be renewable. A state that has almost none should say, no, 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 I don't see why that needs to be renewable. I'll just add to that a little bit because uh, in Cal, like you said, in California, there is very specific renewable definition that includes some things, excludes, certain things like large hydro, that's in uh, public resources code 257441, which defines renewable electrical generation facility. And that's the definition used, you know, when California's legislature refers to some a renewable power plant, that's usually yeah. the definition they're referring to. Notably, the 2045 targets in California use the term zero carbon rather than using renewable. And I think that's that's significant because it's more inclusive of maybe facilities that aren't considered renewable under state law, but are still clean or sustainable. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah that is a component of cleanness, and but it's focused on carbon only. Uh, but presumably, we'd say that most things that can be made carbon free are going to look pretty clean from all air emissions. But uh, and so it's a component of greenness and it's a subcomponent of air quality that we're working in. I would note, if you go around the country, you will see similar definitions like California's, with, even with the exceptions. And, uh, and 
And the difference is just the, when it comes down to it, the pieces in the middle of it that are the list of the things and that are count, but and they all have that type of a definition. Okay, so our next question is from Trevor Rodden, and it says, hi, John, thanks for hosting. I'm curious about the international aspect to meeting state climate goals and reaching net zero. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of offsets on the international level, if this exists? <laughs> so, I mean, the idea is there, it, when we talked about uh, the idea that if California is going to get some renewable energy from, say, Utah, they have to be really confident that that energy from Utah was indeed uh, made renewable. As we get beyond uh, the United States uh, and, and a few other countries we might think are less likely to, to be accurate, and we go to uh, some countries around the world that are notorious for corruption and deception and fraud, it, we get a little nervous about this. We have the same problem with organic food certification, uh, but organic food certification, at least it's a little more of the consumer and there's a lot of different entities that can rate it. California is going to get some renewable energy credits from Kenya uh, they're going to have to know that those things count. So policymakers are very nervous. Another reason we get into some of that is we can't do that forever. Uh, eventually, the whole world has to accomplish what they need to accomplish. California shouldn't have to, to go out beyond its borders too far. And if they pull too much of the stuff away from, say, Utah as credits, then the problem might be California isn't doing enough on its own. Eventually, everybody's going to need to move towards renewable energy. Eventually, we're going to be out of all these temporary sources. So, in, so we should think in the long run, renewable energy credits will be some kind of a tool where needed to offset two regions where one has more capacity than the other. So trying to go out to the international level might not really be such a good idea. We ought to at least first focus on our territorial area. Great, I think we can answer the remaining two. Uh, so this is from Benjamin Whittle again. In your experience, has CEQA been a roadblock to adoption of renewables and electrification due to litigation, or has it boosted the adoption of renewables and electrification by requiring mitigation? So I don't know that you could ever say CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, the NEPA equivalent law for California that's designed to make sure that projects meet standards would ever be something you think that would boost something. It's designed to, to at least make sure after going through a process that they're acceptable. So the other hand, has it, has it hurt them? It depends on who you talk to. If you're the developer of a wind facility and the process has found you to have unacceptable environmental impacts that aren't mitigatable, you might think it held you back, it slowed you down. If you talk to somebody who thinks those were legitimate environmental impacts, they'd say that process was necessary. Uh, what it does and what it has done has uh, it creates a process that people have to go through and it creates opportunities for people to use anything they can find to slow down the process. I often talk about the development process being like a three legged stool where you have three pieces that all have to come into coalition at one time. The permits have to arrive and they have a permit window of, say, two years, five years before they expire. The ownership and control of the property has to come in. You, you control all the things you need. And that, often those have even narrower windows. The contract for the purchase of the wind turbines expires if you don't pay the money in a certain amount of time. And then the third is finance. And the biggest challenge is timing those three legs. And that CEQA acts as the, as unless you're in the Energy Commission jurisdiction, uh, for instance, but it's still some agency is regulating the timeline for the permitting when you're going to get the permits and how long they're good for. Then you got the finance and the contract. And the biggest challenge for developers is not really how long that process is going to take. It's how way they timed all three of them, because you could have a perfectly viable pro project and it happens that gets its permits, but never gets built because the developer messed something else up on timing or sometimes underestimated their costs and they can't make any money. But so those three components together drive the failure of projects more so than one particular thing. But California, uh, I've seen projects that have been held up by somebody, not for the environmental reasons they were opposing them for, but because they didn't want it in their backyard. And whether that was fair or not, that's part of the local government's decision-making process to decide, is that a significant environmental impact? Is it mitigatable and can it be paid for? Great. Uh, so we had a question about other states. Can you point us to where to learn, or where to begin to learn more about how weather in other states, like the colder states, affects their energy laws? And is weather variability why Congress cannot pass a national law? <laughs> it's a, well, Waxman Markey would be one good example of the challenge of getting and getting enough states' votes to accomplish something. 
It, I think a great example of that is even the, the rate at which the adoption of electric cars slows as we go north uh, into the colder areas. People get nervous and they get scared. Is my electric car going to work or not? Um, I, I'm a little more interested in a reliable, independent power source than I am its greenness. And so national laws push things like that much faster. The challenge for that, though, is every state has a different interest, and sometimes it's regional. So the north, more north we go, we see states that are a little more concerned about heating in the winter. The weird thing about this is we don't really rely on electricity for heating very much. And, and so when we just talk about the electricity sector, it, a lot of states can get on board simply by doing that. And the easiest way to see what states are doing on electricity was that website on that one page, dsire.org. Uh, uh, but there are other ones that put all the rules together. If you get beyond electricity, the, and we looked at transportation, uh, you can pretty much see there's some states on the West Coast and some in the Northeast that are pushing to electrify the transportation sector, and nobody else really is at this point. And then if we talk about heating, nobody really wants to, uh, because if you talk about heating in the North, uh, they don't feel like trying to electrify their heating sector while they're also trying to electrify their transportation sector. And they're not going to see something other than natural gas as being the right thing to use. But that goes to the idea of balance. Nobody's really said that the whole entire world has to stop using all fossil fuels. California is really doing way beyond what it needs to do to pull us back from if everybody just went half the distance California is trying to go, we'd be there. California is trying to do it to show the world what can be done and maybe to make a bigger difference. But the real key is not to say that we're not going to use up fossil fuels, but we should be using up really carefully and just at the right rate and learning how to mitigate their consequences. And so the slower we consume, say, even the coal in the ground, till we have the technology to, say, scrub off the carbon dioxide emissions, the better off we are. The more we just waste it on electricity and not think about it, one, the coal is gone and it is a resource, and two, we've been producing it in a way where it's impacting and hurting the earth. So for the North, it's going to be a combination of slow, much more slowly weaning them off of particularly the heating sector and maybe even some of the transportation sector so that but there, I, I like to say the, the, the most amazing thing that's happened in my 20 years as an energy lawyer is when I became one, climate change wasn't even on the table. Today, it is the driver of energy law and policy. And what it's doing is forcing us to do something we really need to do anyway, which is prepare for the day when we run out of fossil fuels. That day will come. Some people think we're at peak oil right now already. So, but, but what it's doing is it's preparing us and it's pushing us to do it sooner. And what that means is when the day comes that we're really running out of them, even for somebody in the north where they really got to figure out how to heat their home, the technology, the infrastructure, the ability is going to be there because of the efforts that were made everywhere else. Great. So in our last two minutes, I just wanted to run through our last few slides here to point, to point our attendees to some upcoming things. Could you go to the next slide, please? Yep. Uh, so, of course, in September uh, this year, uh, instead of October, from the 12th through the 15th, We'll be hosting the Environmental Law Conference at Yosemite. Uh, there's more information on our website here. We're currently hard at work developing the panels and sessions and putting together a great event for you. It's a really wonderful time of year, and I encourage you all to attend. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have a, a diversity and inclusion fellowship program. I'm one of the co-chairs for this as well, which uh, in particular interest to the students who are here today uh, can help fund summer employment in environmental or energy law with a government or a nonprofit entity. And we'll be recruiting for this starting in the fall. Um, and there's our website if you're interested in learning more about this program. Next slide. We also have a mentorship program that also recruits in the fall. This is to pair uh, students as well as newer attorneys who maybe aren't involved in environmental law yet or are still finding their way with more experienced attorneys working in energy and environment and climate um, as a mentorship service. Uh, and we launched this two years ago. We expanded it this past year and we'll be running it again next year. So you can learn more about this at the link below. Finally, last slide. Here's our uh, 101 series webpage where you can find this and other recordings of prior sessions, as well as slide decks, as well as John and my contact information. Just wanted to thank all of the attendees for coming here today and for your great questions during the Q&A session. I hope you found this as useful as I did. And John, thank you so much for putting this together and joining us. I really appreciated it. Glad to. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.